and feared in their own time. They were ancient warriors who invented the boot camp, the frontal assault, state-sponsored education, and a lifestyle and aesthetic that, to this day, bears their name. They are the Spartans, and this is their story. Four eighty BC, a narrow mountain pass at Thermopylae, roughly eighty five miles northwest of Athens, Greece. It was the time and the place that would forever crystallize the essence of Sparta in a single event that future generations will turn to again and again as a turning point in history. What transpired at Thermopylae has been burned in the memory of Western civilization. Thermopylae was actually a, a myth enacted in real life. Um, Shakespeare himself could not have concocted more of a, of a classic story. A phalanx of 7,000 Greek warriors advanced on an invading Persian army of several hundred thousand. The Greeks were horribly outnumbered, but they pressed on, confident that the 300 men in the front lines could lead them to victory, simply because they were 300 men from Sparta. A Spartan soldier taken by himself is as good as any other soldier. But you put them together and you've got an army that is better than any army in the world. Just the sight of the Spartan army's signature Lambda emblazoned on a wall of shields was often enough to secure victory. There was nothing else like it in the world. It was the premier warrior culture of all time in, in civilized society. The pitifully outnumbered Greeks miraculously held off the Persian onslaught through two days of gruesome combat. Finally, the Spartan king, Leonidas, realized that defeat was inevitable. He ordered thousands of remaining Greek soldiers to run for their lives. But all 300 Spartans stood their ground and fought to the last man because they were Spartans. The stand at Thermopylae galvanized uh, uh, Greek morale. It also bloodied the Persians and said to the Persians, don't mess with us. The Spartans stand at Thermopylae became a classic example of losing the battle, but winning the war. Thermopylae has remained in history as a great, as a code word almost for the concept of uh, giving one's life, even in defiance of death. These soldiers were willing to fight a losing battle in defense of their virtue and their country. They became the greatest fighting force the world has ever known. It took a unique society to produce such men, men who fought so methodically in the face of impending death. The Spartans exemplify something that's a very important part of human nature, a drive for purity, a drive for order, a drive for harmony, a drive that gives us the courage not to fear death, and a drive that makes us fight for an ideal such as freedom at any cost. While today we think of Athens as the birthplace of Western civilization and the high water mark of Greek culture, it was Sparta that many Golden Age Greeks admired most. They were really thought of as a, as a kind of a, an ideal of Greek civilization. But it was a utopia in the sense that it was dedicated to an ideal of virtue, of service to the community, of selflessness and unity. What the Greek city-state valued most of all was freedom from foreign intervention, a sense of belonging, and success on the battlefield. Sparta was abundant in all three. During Sparta's reign, ancient Greece was a collection of more than 1,000 self-governing communities called city-states. A city-state is really a city which functions for all practical purposes like a state or a nation has its own government, its own army, its own navy, and its own laws. There were all of these states 
everywhere, many of them very remarkable for their culture. Sparta dates back to the 12th century BC, a time of great change in the ancient world, when Egyptian power was waning and the second Babylonian empire was on the rise. According to Greek legend, Sparta began with violence and conquest, when in 1150 BC, invaders from the north, who believed themselves to be descendants of Hercules, moved south to reclaim what they believed to be their ancestral land. When King Lacedaemon took over the central peninsula, he named it Laconia after himself. He named the central capital Sparta after his queen. For nearly 400 years, until roughly 750 BC, Sparta was Laconia's religious, cultural and governmental center. Art and music flourished. Sparta is known for its beautiful choruses of singing women. The Spartans have a very attractive pottery that was traded. They were uh, famous for bronze working. These are very early examples of Laconian artistry. No fine art of Spartan origin has been found that dates after the 7th century BC. It's as if the people of Sparta just stopped making it. The turning away from the kinds of visual arts that we see uh, as prominent elsewhere is very clearly a self-conscious decision. It was a decision that coincided with the greatest turning point in Sparta's history, a period known as the Mycenaean Wars. It began when a population explosion forced Sparta to seek new land and new sources of food. They solved their problem by annexing an entire country which was both larger in population and territory than Sparta was. So that quirk of fate, that will change the course of Spartan history for the next 300 years. The land they chose to take over was Messenia, a separate Dorian community directly to the west. There's really nothing to make Sparta look absolutely strange and distinctive uh, until the conquest of Messenia and its aftermath. Messenia had rich farmland and a thriving agricultural economy. Today, it is where the famous Kalamata olives are grown. Messenia was also surrounded by rich stores of iron, Greece's most precious commodity for military equipment. Sparta needed Messenia, but the Messenians did not go quietly. This was a long and hard war. The Spartans were not able to put down Messenian resistance easily or quickly. The initial difficulty is simply topographical, getting over Mount Taygetos, which at its peak is 8,000 feet. But of course, you don't go over the peak, you go round the side, and that means a detour, and that means marching a very long way. So you're very far from your base. The people of Messenia were on their way to creating their own city-state culture. They resisted, they tried to remain independent, but the Spartans defeated them. It would take nearly a hundred years for Sparta to fully overtake the Messenians. But by the 7th century BC, Sparta ultimately controlled 8,000 square kilometers and became the largest city-state in the Greek Empire. The Messenians were forced to work the land as agricultural serfs called helots. Helotage is a kind of tenant farming. A helot has a farm to which he must dedicate a certain part of every year's produce to a Spartan master. A particular Spartan master is in charge of each helot's farm, and yet the master doesn't actually own that helot as an out-and-out -out slave. He can't buy him and sell him. No other city-state tried to enslave an entire Greek people. There's probably 250,000 residents of Messenia, and Spartan society is coalesced around 10,000 Spartan warriors. So they're vastly outnumbered. We ought to think of Sparta as a state under siege. In some sense, there's an analogy here to modern Israel. Now, of course, there are many, many differences, but the Spartans and the Israelis have this in common, that they cannot afford the luxury uh, of giving up their security needs. The situation called for the Spartans to remake their society from top to bottom. They developed new rules that would control 
every aspect of its citizens' lives. They are the only Greek population that devotes itself entirely to the arts of war. According to the Greek historian Plutarch, the architect of this new warrior city-state was a Spartan lawmaker named Lycurgus. Lycurgus reportedly traveled throughout the Mediterranean, gathering the best of military statecraft from Crete, from Ionia, and from Egypt. He also received divine guidance from the oracles at Delphi, where, it was said, advice from Apollo was transmitted directly to him. With these new disciplined guidelines, Sparta eventually transformed itself into a great militaristic society. The armies, or the defenders in those days, were really just malicious. They were just farmers taking down spears from above the fireplace and getting out there and fighting. Lycurgus, the original founding Spartan, so to speak, I think he just kind of said, hey, let's turn pro here. And then the whole society sort of unspooled from that decision, for good or ill. His laws prevailed because they came with the authority of the Delphic Oracle. And the Oracle said, that these laws should be obeyed as though they were divine laws. Lycurgus may have been a man or the instrument of a legend, but in either event, the Spartans believed that it was Apollo's God-given wisdom that led them to create a master plan for Sparta. Their society was based on a pyramid of power. At the top were the roughly 10,000 men of the Spartan elite, they were called, in Greek, the homoioi, meaning the equals. In theory, each would have the same wealth and the same say in the government. The goal was to make a society of equals, an army that could fight and where there would be no dissension, a polity that had unity. Everything aims at homogeneity, similarity, if you will, and that is one of the keys to the Spartan system. We're going to have stability, we're going to have order, we're going to have obedience. Below the homoioi were the roughly 50 to 60,000 free people who lived throughout Laconia, mostly on the outskirts of the capital city of Sparta. They were called the perioikoi, the dwellers around. They allowed them to be independent, except that they couldn't make any political decisions. And they also compelled them to follow the Spartans whithersoever they may lead. The perioikoi were essentially a non-voting middle class that kept the homoioi prepared for war. The great bulk of the trade and uh, the manufacturing, the craftsmanship that was necessary to maintain Spartan society, somebody had to make them weapons uh, after all, uh, was done by these perioikoi. They were the engine that made it all work because they freed the Spartan peers so that they had full leisure time to train athletically and every other way for war. All pursuits not essential to the new Spartan machine were abandoned. I think it's clear that one of the prices the Spartans paid for this solution to their problem was a cultural deprivation that they imposed on themselves. Because artistic creativity requires a degree of freedom that I think would have made them nervous. At the bottom, and outnumbering everyone else, were the helots. The wives and daughters of the Spartan elite ran their households. This system left the equals responsible only to the polis, their Greek city-state. They were willing to go to what turned out to be extreme measures to shape a state the like of which no one had ever seen before and I suppose nobody has really seen since. In the decades to come, Sparta would devise a new system of government that would control every citizen from cradle to grave. In the 7th century BC, Sparta was unique among all the several hundred city-states that surrounded the Aegean. In every Greek polis, the state played more of a role in governing people's lives than many of us would accept today. Sparta went several degrees better. In no other city-state was the government as intrusive. This was a cradle-to-grave deal. 
In fact, it was in the cradle that the first measure of the future Spartan equal was taken. At birth, government overseers examined each newborn infant of the elite to determine if he or she should be allowed to live. Less than superior infants were exposed, the Spartan euphemism for leaving an imperfect child to die in a mountain chasm. This seems extraordinarily brutal, but the aim is to produce warriors. And so that's what they're looking for in these newborn children. They needed good men, so I think that they would be unapologetic about the fact that they were breeding the best and strongest that they could. Girl babies, too, had to be approved by the board of overseers who decided whether they should live or be chucked off the edge of a mountain. The surviving girls were raised to be mothers. The boys were raised to become Spartan equals, warriors who controlled the government. In Sparta, the government was by the people and for the people. If you were one of the homoioi, the equals, everyone else, the periokoi and the helots, were non-citizens. The Spartans were uniquely successful in devising a unique system, let's say peculiar to them, that lasted for very, very many years, in fact so long, that Machiavelli and others took it as a model. At the top of the Spartan government was a hereditary monarchy with a strange twist. The crucial starting point, which seems to be the most ancient part of their constitution, is they didn't have one king, they had two kings. Now this is really weird. Uh, most Greek cities um, had a memory of a time when they had a king. And many Greek cities maintained a kind of religious official who sometimes kept the name the king. The Spartans, however, had two kings, and they had real authority in society. Certainly real authority to lead the armies, profound uh, religious uh, authority. The reason for this is they serve as checks and balances on each other. They prevent any one man from becoming too powerful. The dual monarchy and 28 Spartiates over the age of 60 created a council of elders known as the Gerousia. The Gerousia set policy and served as the supreme criminal court. Sparta was in some way a gerontocratic society. Old people ruled and there were certain positions open only to old people. And one reason for that was if you survive to be old in a Spartan environment, you must be pretty damn tough. Below the Gerousia was the Assembly of Citizens, which was made up of all Spartan equals over the age of 30 and was the least powerful branch of the Spartan government. The Spartan assembly is not about deliberation. It is about, as it were, taking orders from people who have already decided the proper way for the society to go forward. The assembly is going to say, rah, rah, let's do it, when somebody proposes a policy. Floating above it all was a board of five men called ephors, who ran the military, oversaw the educational system, and had considerable veto power over everyone, potentially even the kings. Their power was kept in check, however, by limiting their terms to one year and making them accountable to the assembly for their actions. Those who serve as ephors or in other offices, at the end of their year in office, automatically go on trial. It's as if every president of the United States were impeached and put on trial at the end of his four years or eight years in office and had to answer charges. The goal of the Constitution uh, was really to avoid allowing anyone or even any single institutional place in the society to become all-powerful. And I think that seems to have worked pretty well. How could you get anything done with all of these people standing in your way? Well, the whole system was invented not to get anything done. Its purpose was not to change, to stop change. It did a terrific job of that. In fact, for close to 400 years, Sparta had the most stable government in the history of ancient Greece. Yet it was anything but a democracy. 
freedom of the citizen is a core element of democracy, the freedom to speak out, um, uh, the freedom to vote your conscience, and uh, freedom of speech was not characteristic of Spartan society. The Spartans had no uh, conviction that freedom was even a good idea. Freedom was simply not in the package of virtues that a Spartan was taught to respect. Job one for the Spartan government was to keep control of the Helots. They knew the Helots hated them, and as one uh, Athenian who knew the Spartans very well once reported that the Helots would gladly eat the Spartans raw. So every year, the first item of business on the Spartan government's agenda was to declare war on the Helots. And that was just sort of a formal way of saying any Spartan peer can kill any Helot any time he wants. Thucydides tells a chilling story about how the Spartans gave out the word that any Helot who thought he had done the best service for Sparta in the war should come forward to be freed. And some 2,000 came forward. And the Spartans put garlands around their heads to indicate their freedom. They marched them up to the temple, and they were never seen again. In addition to maintaining a continuous, formal war on the Helots, the government's main priority was legislating every aspect of life in Laconia. They would do the same things every day. They would roughly marry in the same uh, age period. They would dress alike. They would talk alike. They would act alike. To ensure equality, the government created a system in which, in principle, no Spartan could be wealthier than any other Spartan. If there was a great difference in wealth or in obvious creature comforts, it would be disastrous. They forced the size of the farm that supported each warrior family uh, to be perpetually the same size. And that is only possible if you destroy a market system. And that meant there would, could be no money, there could be no open markets, there could be no exporting and importing. To further eliminate the need for any kind of Spartan shopping spree, all households, by fiat, were designed exactly the same. Everything was functional, plain, and identical. Spartan culture was austere. That's why we use uh, the word uh, Spartan to mean austere or tough today. In Sparta, it's really considered unacceptable for wealthy people to show off in the way that they dress. There is a austerity and equality if you will, a lot of people wearing good Republican cloth coats uh, in Sparta. Uh, or if you think about the movement to have uniforms in our schools today, uh, it's a similar sort of idea that clothes should not show inequality. Even the speech of the elite Laconians was required to be austere. The Spartans were uh, trained to be men of few words. It matched the simplicity and the force of uh, Spartan warriors. The conic speech uh, is good for making snap decisions on the battlefield, but it's not good for sitting back and thinking about the big picture. And that's one of the big problems that the Spartans have. To keep this system in place, Sparta's stand on foreign policy was equally laconic. Don't mix with strangers. They didn't want anybody learning too much about Sparta, and furthermore, they didn't want Spartans learning too much about the rest of the world. They wanted to preserve their customs. They wanted to preserve their nationality. And really, one doesn't preserve that by uh, mingling with others. Basically, they never left home. And on those occasions when groups of Spartans had to be away, connected with some military thing, for some period of time, they almost always misbehaved and went crazy because they simply didn't have any way of coping with that. If all of these controls sound impossibly intrusive, they were. But government control over society was an accepted part of life in ancient Greece. When the Greeks spoke about politics, they didn't only refer to a narrow constitution, a political arrangement. They thought that a regime was about the social arrangement, the cultural arrangement, the entire way of life. And we see this built into the Spartan system. 
The primary means of indoctrinating Spartans into this new society would be an educational system that prepared seven-year-olds to become killing machines. The success of Sparta depended on a tightly controlled society. Over a 100-year period during the 7th century BC, Sparta invented and perfected the world's first system of social engineering. Control by the state began at birth. Inferior children were killed. Superior children were indoctrinated, trained, and molded into the kind of fighting force that could control the helots, the enslaved people of Messenia. Once you have a small population that must enslave a large population, then each Spartan, in the Spartan view, must be qualitatively superior to every 10 or 12 Messenians. The only way they felt they could achieve that uh, level of military excellence was to bring all of the youths in a group, give them standardized training, and do it from a very early age. When they were seven years old, Spartan boys were taken away from home to be cared for and trained by the state. They lived in a kind of military academy called the Agoge. At uh, age seven, uh, the young Spartan boy enters the world of males that really will be his life for uh, the rest of his time, for as long as he, as he survives. Uh, initially, uh, he is brought into uh, what I have sometimes uh, called uh, the Cub Scout troop from hell. The Agoge is 15 years long pep rally. The Spartans are being prepared to go into battle. And here an alleged saying of Patton uh, comes to mind. Patton is, is supposed to have said to his men, I don't want you to kill for me, I want you to die for me. And that's the thing about the Spartans, they are ready to die. For a Spartan boy's first five years in the Agoge, from age seven to age 12, a government trainer in chief called a Paidonomos instructed him in basic literacy and physical education. Discipline and punishment, however, were often meted out by slightly older boys. The way to think about it is as if the toughest kids from your junior high school uh, were put in charge of you uh, when you just entered uh, first grade. Uh, it is, I think, you know, a system that, in a sense, uses the potential sort of cruelty of children towards one another in order to try to teach this Spartan kid you know, from the very earliest age that he has to absolutely obey every order that he is given from anyone who is a superior. It is a, a terrifying sort of vision. The main lesson in the Agoge from day one was to toughen the boys for the hard life that lay ahead of them. The Spartan training system was clearly meant to test for weakness and to cull out weakness. Uh, and throughout his life, a Spartan warrior had to worry about being watched by his fellow Spartans. They were constantly watching him for weakness, watching to see if he is really up to speed. Again and again, the rule in the Agoge is, can you take it? How tough are you? Are you tough enough to be a Spartan male? This is a tough love system, and it's more tough than love. Spartan girls also received training, but at home. She was trained from childhood uh, to be tough, um, to be physically fit at any rate, to be presumably to some extent self-reliant. Because their raison d'etre was to produce strong sons to defend the community, um, they ate well, they participated in athletics, so they were, in a way, prime breeding specimens. At age 12, Spartan boys entered the second level of agoge training, and conditions got much worse. Each boy was issued a single cloth cloak. This was the only garment they were allowed to wear year-round. They were also required to go barefoot, all in the name of toughening them physically and mentally. Anybody who's been to Laconia in the winter can see that the very idea that you would go barefooted or you'd have a single cloak would kill a modern American within minutes. Tired and cold, the boys were also hungry. Evening meals were cooked, if that's the right word, by the helot attendants. 
and they cooked um, absolutely horrendous food, apparently. And the most famous meal of the Spartans is what's called the blood soup. It's basically pork with a lot of blood floating around. Travelers to Sparta were appalled at the Spartan diet. One famous description was recorded by a visiting Sybarite from the north. And he came to Sparta and he said, after sampling this soup, he now understood why the Spartans were so willing to die. The soup was not only bad, there wasn't enough of it. You get enough food to survive, but you don't get enough food to be happy. Uh, and so you're taught right away that if you want to get enough food to be happy, to feel full, you're going to have to steal it. That was done in part to keep them sharp, but also in part to teach them survival skills, because it was all part of the business of making a Spartan, who would be the kind of guy who could manage to forage around the country and make a, keep himself alive if he had to. A Spartan child who is caught stealing will be punished, and yet a Spartan child who does not steal will be regarded as a complete wimp. If you are very good at cheating and you don't get caught, then uh, you, in fact, will flourish. The length one boy went to so as not to get caught was recorded by Plutarch. According to his account, a very hungry young boy stole a fox cub to eat. When a superior suspected he had stolen the fox, the boy hid the vicious little animal under his cloak. Rather than be found out, the boy let the trapped animal bite away at his flesh until he died. This was taken throughout antiquity as an example of Spartan toughness. You know, that that boy had been taught uh, to be so unflinching, um, to deal with pain, uh, to uh, uh, be respectful to his superiors. On the other hand, he was being eaten alive from the inside. Toughening and strengthening Spartan adolescence was deemed necessary because of the kinds of battles they would one day fight. The phalanx is as strong as the weakest link. So the crucial element is to make sure that everyone is more or less equally strong and that those who are weaker are simply eliminated. It was said of the Spartans that they were the only nation that when they went to war, things actually got easier for them. Life in the Agoge was a weeding out process. Boys were continually required to pass tests of strength, flexibility, endurance, and cunning. Failure was severely punished. At the annual festival at the temple of Artemis Orthia, Spartans would gather to watch a test that might be called the grab for the cheese. The young men of Sparta divide into two groups. One group tries to steal the cheese that is piled up on the altar, and another group armed with whips try to prevent them from doing so. In that kind of melee, uh, there are going to be occasions when people die. Much of what young Spartan males were put through seems like a forecast of the most ominous aspects of modern fraternity hazings. And indeed, there were many Spartan boys who, when the tests were over, had not passed and had died. It's a constant competition whereby everybody is being judged, graded in effect, and then there are winners who are given various advantages, various honors. So here's your Spartan. He, he is trained both to be like everybody else and to subordinate everything to the commonality and to be superior to everybody else. To help guide them through their training, each Spartan boy was required to take a mentor, an older man whose association with the boy continued for life. It was the responsibility of the mentor to watch out for uh, a young boy that was in his care, to see that the training uh, was proper and to see that manners and character were also receiving appropriate attention. Modern scholars debate as to whether or not the depth of their friendship included a sexual relationship. In many situations in which women are excluded from participation, whether it's the military or whether it is something else, then uh, I think the potential 
for even a homoerotic relationship is much higher. The expectation was that any sexual relationship that may have existed when they were young would be ended uh, at the point in which the boy becomes an adult. But it was expected to continue as a very, very close, tight friendship. And that web of friendships of people who had been mentors and mentees or lovers uh, was part of uh, the glue that kept Spartan society together. So that any time the Spartan army was in battle, there would be men who had the closest possible relationship with each other of a personal kind, standing next to each other in the battle line, the question of cohesion of units, of small units, is decisive in warfare. Can you imagine anything more cohesive than a unit made up of men uh, of this type? As a Spartan male grew older, he would be systematically introduced to two new and distinct, yet entirely practical experiences, marriage, and cold-blooded murder. Sparta's legacy is that they not only created the idea of military discipline, but that they also perfected it through a social structure and a training program that began at age seven. By 20, most Spartan males graduated from the one system and entered another, one that would remain part of their lives until death. But before they could graduate, Spartan boys were put to one final test. The most promising students were selected to join the Cryptea, a secret security force dedicated to disposing of helots for any reason. Members of the Cryptea lived outside of Sparta, survived by their wits, and used the cover of darkness to cut throats. The crypta could be regarded as a re-adaptation of a manhood ritual. And we know of many societies where in order to prove that you're ready to be a man, you have to achieve some particularly exceptional feat. But the Spartan version involves killing the enemy within. The cryptea then was a way for the Spartans to take their best and the brightest and use them to uh, make life absolute hell uh, for the people on whom the whole Spartan society was based. If you were a particularly handsome helot, if you were a helot who was known for agricultural innovations, if you were a helot who was thought to be in any way exceptional, you had to live in constant fear that the Cryptea would find out about how you stood out and made sure that you got dead. After their term in the Cryptea, Spartan males joined small regiments of 15 men each. These units were called Susidia, and they would be the Spartans' home for most of their lives. So this is just an absolutely key moment. You had to be accepted into a regiment, and really everything you were doing up to that point leads to this moment um, uh, of acceptance. Although a Spartan's first duty is to his regiment, each man was also required to get married and produce children. To the outside world, this would seem to be a more pleasant aspect of Spartan life, since the women of Sparta were considered the most beautiful in the world. After all, Helen of Troy was originally a Spartan. But for Spartan men and women who had almost no contact with each other as children, courtship and marriage was just another form of duty to the state that carried with it some of the more strange rituals in Spartan society. You're really almost dealing with two separate societies, and their courtship rituals seems to reflect this. Marriages were arranged there was no wedding ceremony. Instead, the nuptials took the form of a kind of ritualized abduction. The bride's hair was cut short and she was dressed in a man's cloak. Then, the groom had to sneak into the house after dark in order to consummate the marriage. That was the beginning of their marriage, uh, their married life. Singularly joyless, I think, um, ritual and very significant. In fact, the only time newly married men were supposed to visit their own homes was after dark, 
with the sole purpose of impregnating their wives. This was part of Lycurgus's law to keep passion alive and so make it harder for the lovers to get together, make it more of an adventure, you know, skulking away at night to meet in secret. And then as soon as they would consummate their love, the guy had to beat it back to his common mess. So that uh, it was said that it was not uncommon for a Spartan husband never to have seen his wife in daylight until he was 30 years old. You're talking about a very strange society. When you think about these extraordinary checks on normal human impulses that were part of the picture. The purpose of marriage, according to the city-state, was to produce children, preferably boys. The only way a Spartan man can get his name on his gravestone is to have died in battle for Sparta. The only way a Spartan woman can get her name on her gravestone is to have died in childbirth. Reproduction was so crucial, in fact, that Spartans went to extraordinary lengths to make sure women had as many healthy children as possible. So we do have incidents, very strange incidents, where men um, invite younger men whom they think are better than they are to have relations with their wife with the idea that their offspring might in fact be better than themselves. It is this kind of eugenic tendency, the idea that once you've got a proven Spartan, that that proven Spartan should uh, continue in the genetic line of Spartans uh, is absolutely at the center of their concerns. All of these controls on marriage and family were designed to keep the men from being distracted from their main purpose, to drill and train, to terrorize the helots, and to uphold their own Spartan superiority. Whether the Spartans really believed in their heart of hearts uh, that they were uniformly men of virtue, or whether, you know, in his heart of hearts, a Spartan thought, wow, I wish I could have a weekend in Athens every now and again and have some fun, we don't know. Uh, but uh, what we do know is that the Spartans uh, created a vision um, of themselves as completely content uh, with their perfectly virtuous lives. The great irony, however, was that even though they had the best trained military in the world, the Spartans didn't use it to fight other armies. It's a magnificent military machine, but the attitude of the Spartans seems to be, let's not risk it, let's not use it, let's admire it, let's polish those shields, but let's not use them unless we have to. It was a system that worked inside Sparta remarkably well for two centuries. But then, for reasons that are not entirely clear, Sparta began to look outside its own borders for new people to conquer. Perhaps the war machine was in danger of growing rusty from disuse. Perhaps they were simply itching for a real fight. The Spartans confidently thought that their two great adversaries, the Argives and the Tegians, would be pretty easy to defeat. And they're now ready to expand, as it were, to bring more territory within the same system. At the same time, there was a real threat to Spartan supremacy on the horizon a nation of more than a million warriors, hell-bent on conquering Greece. They were the Persians. By the beginning of the 5th century, they're going to start first to conquer the Ionian Greeks in Asia Minor, and then to look toward the mainland. And that's going to explain all of subsequent Greek history for the next two centuries. For generations to come, all of Greece would feel the threat from Persia. How Sparta and Athens reacted to that threat would both divide and unite the Greek world. At the end of the 7th century BC, Greece was a loose confederation of more than 1,000 fiercely independent city-states, each with its own character and reputation. Athens was the largest, with a sophisticated cultural life, great architecture, and an impressive navy. But Sparta, which was revered above Athens by all the city-states around the Aegean, had none of these. Instead, it had sacrificed culture at the altar of war. Sparta was an armed camp. And that would mean that the educational system is going to be focused more on military affairs, there's going to be a creation of a secret police, there's going to be a dis... Um, 
engaging from the rest of Greece for a while. They're not going to send out colonies. They're not going to build a fleet. They're going to be obsessed with this one problem of controlling Messenia. Since the end of the 8th century BC, Sparta had subjugated Messenia, a country whose population outnumbered the Spartans by at least 10 to 1. They did it through a kind of slavery called helotage and through a campaign of terror carried out by highly trained warriors. Sparta was the first country to develop what would come to be known as Western military discipline. Modern ideals of drilling, marching, rank and file, and the science of the phalanx assault were all invented by the Spartans. In this chaotic world of hoplite warfare, the Spartans had learned that people who kept their head, who kept together, who did not allow gaps between them, could create a greater cohesion and defeat the enemy. Among the phalanxes, uh, the Spartans were the most elegant, uh, the most able to make changes on the battlefield if changes uh, would be needed. The Spartans also redesigned the armament of war from head to toe. The centerpiece was the three-foot hoplon, or shield, carried by each soldier. Hence the term hoplite to describe the Spartan warrior and those who would adopt their methods later on. Warriors were armed with nine-foot spears, a secondary sword, a heavy helmet with two small openings to see, and bronze body armor. So the entire ensemble or panoply might have weighed 70 pounds, and then the idea that these men, no larger than 5'5", five, five, 120, 130 pounds, would carry half their body weight in the summer seems absurd. So what is the point? And it seems to be a ritually crafted mechanism of of determining an entire war by a single half hour of ritual collision between neighboring city-states. And the Spartans tend to master that um, way of fighting better than anybody. Battles were decided by quick, decisive, and deadly tactics that relied on teamwork and agility. But for nearly 100 years, this new art of war was more theory than reality. Then, in the 6th century BC, the Spartans weren't content with simply conquering and containing the Messenians. They looked to the north and the city-state of Tegea to further expand their territory. However, Sparta was one of the most profoundly religious city-states in Greece and wouldn't act without a favorable word from the gods. And so, a delegation was sent to Delphi to seek the blessing of Apollo, who was believed to speak through a priestess or Pythia. Greek oracles were part horoscope, part fortune cookie, part guesswork, part bribery. People often heard what they wanted to hear. A pilgrimage to Delphi didn't resemble a trip to a fortune teller or a palm reader so much as it did a journey to see the Wizard of Oz. Around 560 BC, the Spartans invaded Tegea. Victory was more than simply winning the war. And then sure enough, Tegea, instead of being an enemy, becomes an ally, and po probably the first ally in a series of alliances which spreads through most of the Peloponnese, and indeed outside the Peloponnese. By the end of the 6th century BC, the intimidating Spartan machine had convinced a number of other city-states in the Peloponnese to join with them. This powerful alliance became known as the Peloponnesian League, with Sparta as its leader. The goal was to create a force to stand against Athens, not so much to overtake the powerful city-state, but to avoid fighting it. It's a simple rule that if you have decisive military superiority and the reputation for decisive military superiority, you can actually avoid the struggles. That's the Spartan policy. They very rarely fight, because every time they fight, they know there is a risk that they'll lose. But an ominous threat from the east would force Sparta out of its insular world. Persia, under Darius I, commanded the largest empire the ancient world had ever known. Among the vanquished were many former Greek city-states, including those in Ionia. 
However, after several decades of oppressive Persian rule and ruinous taxation, the Ionians plotted a rebellion. In 499 BC, they sent a delegation to meet with Sparta's king Cleomenes. Cleomenes refused to assist the Ionians, a decision that set in motion a series of events that changed the course of history. Cleomenes' clearness of vision was not shared by all Greeks. The Athenians were persuaded by the Ionians to send some support to the revolutionaries. Despite the help of Athens, Darius I's powerful empire defeated the Ionians, and Athenian support of the rebels would not be forgotten by the Persians. And having crushed that revolt, they begin to think very seriously about this upstarts in the West who had dared uh, to interfere in what was, by their standards, an internal Persian matter. Meanwhile, Cleomenes embarked on a merciless mission of annexing neighboring city-states to strengthen and expand the Peloponnesian League. The most heinous allegation against him was that when he was attacking Argos, he lures as many as said as 6,000 Argive hoplites into a sacred grove. He then orders Helots, note Helots, not Spartans, to set light to a sacred grove, which then torches all those 6,000 Argives to death for which he was put on trial when he came back into Sparta. The charges were serious, and even the king wasn't exempt from Spartan law. Cleomenes faced the possibility of exile. What was unacceptable was that this was another Greek city, a sacred grove, and the deception was therefore somehow sacrilegious. Nevertheless, he, he survived. He, he lived to fight another day, but he went on under a cloud. In an effort to prevent his own exile, Cleomenes needed to eliminate the forces within the government that were against him. This meant eliminating his competition, that is, the other king of Sparta, Demaratus. To do this, Cleomenes bribed the oracle at Delphi to declare King Demaratus an illegitimate king. Demaratus was immediately deposed and sent into exile. But Cleomenes' treachery was quickly exposed, and he too ended up in exile. When Cleomenes eventually returned, he died a gruesome death by his own hand. And the most extreme version is that he committed suicide by slicing himself from the feet upwards until he reached the vital organs. Cleomenes, who would forever after be known as Cleomenes the Mad, was replaced by King Leonidas, a man who would take the Spartans where they had never gone before, into an ancient world war of epic proportions. At the dawn of the 5th century BC, an invisible line divided Greek city-states into two distinct groups, those that sided with Sparta and those that stood with Athens. While Sparta tried to maintain its hands-off policy towards warfare, Athens began preparing for the possibility of war with the Persians. There was news that Darius I of Persia was hell-bent on punishing the Athenians for supporting the failed revolt by Ionia in 499. Darius never forgot about it, uh, never forgot about uh, that humiliation. The Greeks claimed that Darius, in fact, delegated uh, a slave to whisper in his ear on a regular basis, um, O oh, king, never forget the Athenians. In August 490 BC, Darius I dispatched a flotilla of ships carrying troops to attack the Athenians. The Persian expedition approached Marathon on the northeastern coast of Attica. It was much larger and better supplied than the Athenians thought they could handle. When the Athenians realized that the Persians really were coming and were about to land at Marathon, they sent a runner down to Sparta. They had had mixed relations with Sparta, sometimes amicable, sometimes otherwise, but they certainly uh, recognized that Sparta was the great military power in Greece. As the story goes, the runner covered 140 miles in two days, only to be told by the Spartans 
that sending troops meant disrupting the Carnean festival, a religious ceremony sacred to Apollo. Sparta promised reinforcements when the festivities were over. Ten days later, the Athenians have to send up their forces. They send every man they can, about 9,000 uh, heavy armed infantrymen, and they square off against the Persian forces, uh, who probably outnumber them by two or three to one at the plain of Marathon. For several days, the Athenians and Persians eyed each other from afar in the hot August sun. Finally, with Spartan reinforcements nowhere in sight, Athenian general Miltiades ordered a surprise attack on the enemy. The Persians are cut to ribbons. The heavy-armed Athenian hoplites proved to be more than a match for the light-armed Persian infantrymen, and there's just a massacre. Meanwhile, the Athenians have sent a runner back to Athens, announcing their victory. In the wake of the stunning Athenian success, the Spartans finally arrived with a hoplite force 2,000 strong. But there was nobody left to fight. When the Spartan army finally gets to Marathon, the Athenians are happy to show them uh, the corpses of the Persians whom the Athenians have handily defeated. So this was something the Spartans had to live down. Meanwhile, the Persians began plotting their revenge. In 486 BC, Darius I chose his son Xerxes to be his successor. Xerxes carefully planned a new and far more elaborate invasion of Greece, a plan that would take years to put into place. By 481, 480, it's pretty clear that Xerxes has been mobilizing for a period of four years, an enormous force, perhaps as many as 250,000 men in his fleet and his land army to come down into Greece proper. And so the Spartans, Athenians, and a small contingent of city-states met to plan a counterattack. They argued over strategy before finally yielding to Spartan Admiral Eurybiades to command both ground and naval forces. It was a challenge he accepted on behalf of all Greece. One, the Spartans are very arrogant. They say, by God, if these wimpy Athenians could defeat the Persians at Marathon, then just imagine what we, Spartans, can do. Two, the more sophisticated Spartans would say, I'm not all that afraid of the Persians, because although there are a lot of Persians, they are not particularly good infantry fighters, and we're the world's best infantry fighters. By the spring of 480 BC, the stage was set. On the Persian side, 46 regional contingents under 30 generals were assembled for the invasion of Greece. They were led by Xerxes, known to both friend and foe as the Great King. The massive force numbered between 200,000 and 300,000 warriors. Xerxes' armies will consume millions of gallons of fresh water daily. It will consume millions of uh, pounds of wheat, fodder, meat. At sea, approximately 750 warships called triremes were flanked by several hundred supply ships. The vast Persian navy moved in tandem with the ground forces. It was a war machine of unprecedented might, requiring masterful planning and execution at every turn. The interdependence of the Persian army, the land army, and the Persian navy is really important in thinking about these wars. The army had to stay linked up with the navy because the navy guaranteed the safety of the supply ships. The Greeks, accustomed to battles involving a few thousand men at most, would soon face an inexhaustible flood of enemy troops. After much debate about what to do, they decided to take a stand at Thermopylae, a scenic spot known as the Hot Gates because of bubbling sulfurous springs nearby. Thermopylae was the gateway to the south. In 480 BC, the pass at Thermopylae was barely 50 feet wide, a spot where Xerxes' enormous advantage in numbers could be neutralized. I think this was one of those times that the moment was comprehended that people realized that they had to make a stand and that if they had not made a stand 
the problem would not be that the Persians would just cross this one particular pass, but rather that morale among the Greeks would just sink into the lowest point and they would lose the war. If the Greeks can hold them at Thermopylae, then in some ways the Persian army will eat itself out of its own home. It's like some great monster that continually has to be fed. The Spartans were led by King Leonidas, a veteran of many campaigns during his 11-year reign. But to win this war, he would be called upon to make the ultimate sacrifice. The oracle at Delphi had said that either the king of Persia would conquer Sparta or a Spartan king must die. Leonidas was well aware of this oracle. Uh, he was also, I think, aware that if the Greeks were going to put up effective resistance to the Persians after Thermopylae, there had to be a glorious moment. There had to be something to make your heart swell. With fire in his belly, Leonidas handpicked his men for what was surely a suicide mission. When Leonidas goes to Thermopylae, he takes with him a royal bodyguard of 300 men. In this particular case, however, the royal bodyguard is specially selected. It is not only selected with regard to the merit of the individuals, it is also selected with regard to the fact that each individual leaves a son behind. I think that the Spartans knew, and Leonidas knew absolutely, that they were going there to die. That was what they had been trained for their entire lives. I think they recognized the psychological value of that for the rest of Greece that had been left behind, that they were enacting a kind of a play to inspire the rest of Greece. To die for one's country, for the Spartans, was the highest form of honor. In August 480 BC, the mighty Persian juggernaut lumbered to a halt across the sun-baked plain. It was an awesome spectacle of power and might. The Persian army, led by King Xerxes, was immense, at least 200,000 strong. The Greeks countered with just over 7,000 troops, including 300 of Sparta's finest hoplite warriors. Why the Spartans committed so few troops is at the core of the Spartan psyche. Could they have done better by sending a full force? They claimed that they were intending to, but a religious festival prevented them from sending more than the advance guard. Cynics will say they had no intention of uh, risking a full force because they knew that they were going to lose. They needed a demonstration they needed some spectacular event, so sacrificing 300 would be absolutely the perfect solution. The Spartans, under the command of King Leonidas, were prepared to fight to the death. When Xerxes sent a messenger demanding the Spartans lay down their arms, Leonidas replied with two words, Molon Lobe, come and get them. No greater contrast between the two armies, no greater contrast between the two societies to have Xerxes up on a throne, having his secretaries take notes. We have Leonidas right out in front of his men. The mission of King Leonidas was daunting, to stall the Persians long enough for Greek generals to muster their forces at the Isthmus of Corinth. They needed time to mount a full-scale counterattack. If the vast weight of the Persian army was allowed to roll freely southward, central Greece would fall, with the Peloponnese sure to follow. So the Greek idea at Thermopylae is quite brilliant. It's to force a stalemate and to create logistical problems for this kind of unwieldy army. When the Greeks arrive at Thermopylae, they rebuild the wall that had been across the pass there. But the notion is that by rotation, they will send out units, Greek units, which will fight in the very constricted area immediately in front of the wall. The Persians won't be able to bring forward their full force because of the constricted terrain immediately in front of the wall. Meanwhile, the people of Delphi consulted the oracle, which advised them to pray to the winds, for they will be good allies to Greece. No sooner had they received this counsel than a violent storm erupted. The formidable Persian navy was strung out along the harborless Magnesian coast, where more than 200 ships were destroyed. Xerxes was furious at the unexpected loss 
and bewildered by the meager challenge to his mighty army at Thermopylae. The great king ordered an advance scout to take the full measure of his opponent. When he sees the Spartans, rather than crying or offering um, to surrender or offering to negotiate, they're actually grooming themselves, combing their hair, uh, putting oil on, putting, shining their weapons. And the idea is that they're looking forward to this battle with zest rather than terror. And so the horsemen just stood there in amazement and they couldn't believe that these, these few small people were going to be trying to defend the past. Demaratus, the exiled Spartan king who had fled to Persia more than a decade before, was promptly summoned for counsel. King Xerxes demanded to know, how tough are these guys? And if we brought one of them here into the court, could he kill ten of us? And uh, Demaratus told him, no, man for man, they're not much better than anyone else. But in a group, he said, you will find, in a cohesive unit that's going to defend this pass, you'll find they're worth many times their numbers. The message from Demaratus was clear. Do not underestimate the Spartan warriors. Fighting was in their blood. It was a way of life. And now the scene was set. With both Greek and Persian forces prepared for battle, what would happen next would decide the future of democracy. Four eighty BC, late summer. The fate of the Western world was at hand. At the narrow mountain pass of Thermopylae, battle lines were drawn between Persia and Greece. Three hundred Spartans and seven thousand Greek allies dug in, prepared to fight a Persian army at least two hundred thousand strong. For the Spartans, it appeared to be a suicide mission, but they had to slow down the Persians long enough for Greece to assemble a counterattack. When King Leonidas was leaving to defend the pass at Thermopylae, and he and he knew that he was going to die, his wife Gorgo, as they were saying goodbye, asked him what were his instructions to her, and he said, "Marry good men and bear good sons." And that's the thing about the Spartans; they are ready to die. They are prepared to die. They think of death in battle for their state as, as truly a glorious thing. And so, in the name of honor and glory, the Spartan soldiers stood defiant and serene, even ready to take on the huge Persian force an advance scout had warned them about. He said that Persian archers were so numerous that when they fired their volleys, it blocked out the sun. So the one Spartan, Dionica, said, good, then we'll have our battle in the shade. On August 18th, 480 BC, four days after arriving at the hot gates of Thermopylae, the two sides readied for battle. The Persians' overwhelming numbers provided them with all the confidence any army could want. But the bronze and crimson Spartan phalanx stood unintimidated and ready to fight. Typically, we hear of uh, a formation eight ranks deep. The reason for having only eight is the first two, three ranks actually fight because you've got very long spears. Therefore, one function of the guys behind is simply to push the ones ahead into fighting. So the cohesion and the push of the back ranks is absolutely key, as key in its way as the prowess and the bravery of the guys in the front. The Persians quickly found their vast numerical advantage was no advantage at all. Once you've given up the idea of maneuver and the idea that Persian horsemen can play no role, then it's almost like a uh, sieve that you've forced all of these people into a bottleneck and the Persians have to go through bronze and iron, and they've never done that before. And they are chopped to ribbons. In the narrow uh, confines of the pass, the heavy armor of the Greeks, their long thrusting spears, uh, their big shields, proved to be quite effective against the lighter armor, the shorter spears of the Persians. It would be a terrible thing, noise of people screaming, people defecating, people urinating, people falling down, people being trampled, spears breaking. And it really turns into a, just a, a scene of carnage. The Greek phalanx was virtually impenetrable, 
and by early afternoon the battlefield resembled a snapshot from hell. The whole pass was littered with corpses, and the Spartans showed no sign of cracking. The Spartan phalanx is almost like a corps de ballet in its ability to move, in its ability to uh, execute uh, quick decisions in, uh, on the battlefield and to move as a unit. And that's one of the things that makes the Spartans uh, so formidable in battle. Xerxes was determined to destroy the Spartan phalanx and stop the bloodbath. He ordered his personal bodyguards, known as immortals, into the fray. Only they wore anything approaching the heavy armor of the Greeks. Still, it wasn't enough. A savage battle left the king's finest troops in total disarray, and as the curtain of death fell around them, they broke off the fighting and retreated. Hoplite mentality and ideology is summable up in one phrase, which is stay your ground or keep in your place. And what the Spartans always contributed was that steadiness, that sort of rock solidity. With darkness falling, Xerxes abandoned the struggle. His colossal beast brought to its knees, the Persian losses in the thousands. Across the blood-spattered plain, the Greeks attended to far fewer casualties. Leonidas walked among the dead, knowing all too well that in a matter of hours, his men would meet a similar fate. Dawn broke cool and clear on the morning of August 19th, 480 BC. King Xerxes of Persia, still reeling from massive losses on day one at Thermopylae, mounted his second assault on the Greeks. This time, he formed a special brigade, men reputed to be of outstanding bravery and daring. He promised them rich rewards to storm the narrow pass and threatened them with execution if they broke ranks and fled. The Persian king just stays at it. I mean, this is um, uh, bulldozer tactics. He figures you just keep on sending your men forward uh, and eventually you'll wear down these Greeks. But once again, the crack Persian force was no match for the Greeks and the elite band of Spartan warriors. As the battle raged on through a second bloody day, it became another large-scale massacre. Slain and wounded Persians were piled high in front of the Greek line. The pungent smell of death everywhere. The Greeks are taking some casualties, but the Persians are taking massive casualties. Uh, and uh, it's simply too demoralizing to let this go indefinitely. From his gold throne high on a hill, Xerxes watched his finest troops suffer savage losses the king was forced to call off another ill-fated attack. After all, the Persian king can probably take um, 50 to 1 casualties and not really feel it. But on the other hand, if he has to take 50 to 1 casualties, uh, and this goes on for weeks on end, uh, there's going to be a tremendous morale problem uh, in his army. So he needs some other way to, to win this thing. It was at this crucial point that a Greek named Ephialtes in exchange for a generous reward, agreed to betray his countrymen by guiding the Persians through a hidden pass over Mount Kalidromos. In Greek, the name Ephialtes has become an ordinary word for all time to mean nightmare. This is the Greek word for nightmare. The path that Ephialtes laid out would allow Persia's downtrodden soldiers to outflank the Greeks a tactic Xerxes believed would finally bring them down. The elite Persian immortals climbed steadily all night, and at dawn the crackling of dried leaves announced their arrival on the other side. The hot gates had become a death trap for the Spartans. Steep cliffs and the ocean on one side, the mountains on the other, with Persian soldiers amassed front and now rear. And at this point, Leonidas takes uh, stock of the situation. He's commander-in-chief uh, in this battle zone, and he orders the bulk of the Greeks uh, at Thermopylae to retreat. Uh, the Spartans will all stay there with him. To a man, the Spartans stay there. After the pass is turned, then we get the great day three, one of the most memorable days in Greek history. Battered and wounded, the proud Spartan warriors donned their heavy armor one last time. 
As they prepared to die, King Leonidas delivered his final words. Now, eat a good breakfast, man, for we'll all be sharing dinner in hell. He decides not ever to surrender, but to fight um, absolutely to the last man. As the sun rose above the hills, the Spartans and their few remaining allies were under attack from front and rear. Still, they fought on valiantly, flinging themselves with furious desperation into the bloody field of battle. When King Leonidas suffered a fatal wound, the Spartans fought savagely for possession of the corpse and succeeded in dragging it away. Finally, around noon on August 20th, 480 BC, the Spartans made their last desperate stand. We're told that their weapons are finally broken, they're discarded, their shields are broken, their armor is rent, and finally they're using their teeth, their hands, and uh, fighting with fist against tens of thousands of Persians who finally surround them on a hill and do not want to waste any more of their manpower and bury them in a sea of arrows. By early afternoon, it was over. All 300 Spartans lay dead, along with several hundred more of their allies. But the Persian losses were staggering, estimated at 20,000. With victory finally in his grasp, Xerxes inspected the battlefield. He found the body of King Leonidas hidden away and had him decapitated, his head displayed on a pole for all to see. It was a barbaric gesture intended to prove that the Spartans were mere mortals after all. But the badly demoralized Persian troops weren't convinced. They knew the war had only just begun and that more Spartans lay in wait. So there is a fear or almost a sense of mystery about the Spartans that infects the Persian ranks after Thermopylae. Thermopylae, we should be clear, is probably the greatest single defeat in any one day in Greek history. That being said, it does have some uh, dividends for the Greeks. It allows the Greeks to mobilize to the rear in Attica. It gives them a sense of heroism, of uh, coalescence around this, this, this act of bravery. And it does strike fear into the Persians that these are people they hadn't counted on. Many years later, a monument was erected at Thermopylae to honor the 300 Spartans who heroically held off 200,000 Persians for three ferocious days. Here, on an unadorned stone, was engraved a classically simple epitaph. Go tell the Spartans, stranger passing by, that here, obedient to their laws, we lie. It stresses the point that this had to be done, no matter what. No matter what private perceptions and private thoughts were, the laws of Sparta dictated for Spartans to be there at this time. In the one sense, um, it was something the Spartans needed. They needed a Spartan Battle of Marathon. They needed a time in which they could show that Spartan virtue was absolutely outstanding. Even if they didn't win, they had won the moral victory because they died to the last man. What transpired at Thermopylae has been burned in the memory of Western civilization. After the fall of the Alamo, the local newspaper in Nagadoches, Texas, proclaimed that Thermopylae now has a parallel. With the Greeks' first line of defense now breached, the Persians were free to drive south through Attica, implementing a scorch and burn policy that spared nothing and no one. Crops and farms went up in smoke. Statues of gods were demolished, temples destroyed. Even the Acropolis was set on fire. When word spread throughout Greece that the whole country was ablaze, many Athenians were on the verge of mutiny. They would never have believed that the tide was about to turn. In the last decades of the 5th century BC, all of the forces in Greece were briefly united against a single enemy, the seemingly invincible force of the more than 200,000 strong Persian army. After the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 BC, the Persian army and navy were free to drive south towards Athens. 
Greek morale seemed low and defeat imminent. But the Greeks decided to place their trust in a shrewd and respected Athenian commander named Themistocles. And the decision is made by the great commander Themistocles to evacuate the hinterland and go over to the island of Salamis and rest the hopes of Greece on a sea battle. The Athenians then decide to withdraw from their territory, not try to face down the Persians in some kind of a hopeless uh, land battle, but rather withdraw from their territory, send their women and children to refugee camps uh, in southern Greece behind the Isthmus Wall, uh, and to put all of their faith in their navy. Under cover of darkness, the Greek navy embarked for the Bay of Salamis, some 60 miles down the coast. With its narrow channel, Themistocles was confident Salamis was the ideal spot to counter the superior numbers and greater mobility of the Persian fleet. And Themistocles knows if they can break the Persian navy, then they've really won the war, or at least they've gone a long way towards winning the war because of the interdependence of the Persian army and the Persian navy. With the Greek navy now in place, Themistocles devised a brilliant tactic to lure King Xerxes into making a disastrous move. Themistocles sends, sends him a slave and says, you know, uh, Xerxes, Themistocles would like to be your friend, has seen the light. Um, and you can capture the entire Greek fleet if you just attack now. In a letter delivered by a slave, Themistocles spelled out plans for a Greek withdrawal from Salamis to be carried out under cover of darkness the following night. Xerxes thinks this is a great opportunity. Um, after all, he had experience with traitors. Uh, Epialtes had showed up just about at the right time at uh, Thermopylae, and now here was uh, this guy Themistocles. Great. Convinced the Greek navy was in total disarray, Xerxes decided it was the perfect time to strike. So uh, Xerxes does it launches the Persian fleet against the Greek fleet in the very constricted waters around Salamis, which is exactly what Themistocles had hoped for. Themistocles knew those waters intimately. He had his uh, fleet stationed to take advantage of the constriction. He also knew when the wind was going to come up behind them and so when they could charge out most effectively. And what happens is that the Persians charge forward, the Greeks charge forward on their ships, I think we could say it was probably the greatest sea battle in sheer numbers involved in the history of Western civilization. While the Greek fleet moved out like a giant octopus from its rocky lair, King Xerxes was safely perched atop his gold throne at Mount Aguileus. By the time he realized his powerful vanguard was trapped, the noose had already tightened. The Persian advantage in numbers, 400 triremes to 300 for the Greeks, was quickly neutralized in the narrow straits. And the whole thing gets locked up into kind of a log jam very quickly. The Persian ships are not able to maneuver. So once you could just turn the battle into ramming and, and make some incursions inside this, the Persian fleet, then drowning would be your greatest ally. The Greek ships have posted marines on them, hoplites, who then jump from ship to ship, doing great massacre. It was probably the single largest casualty rate of any sea battle in history. There may have been 60,000 Persians that drowned in the, right off the coast of Attica. It's a great disaster for the Persians. It's an out-and-out uh, victory for the Greeks. The water was thick with bodies and wreckage. The Persians lost 200 warships, the Greeks just 40. Xerxes was angry and humiliated. The result of the Battle of Salamis is that Xerxes and the bulk of his army has to evacuate Greece. He simply can't keep a grand army in Greece uh, unless he can be absolutely sure of being able to resupply it with loss of control at sea, with uh, loss of dominance uh, on the waves. He is uh, at risk uh, and the bulk of his army then is evacuated. 
But Xerxes' cousin, General Mardonius, was personally chosen to carry on the war in Greece. With a crack force of 30,000 men, Mardonius moved north to Thessaly, where there were adequate supplies to see his men through the winter. Meanwhile, Athens and Sparta were bickering jealously among themselves. The Athenians, who bore the brunt of the naval battles, expected a quid pro quo from Sparta's celebrated hoplite warriors, demanding that they lead a ground assault against the Persians. Mardonius learned of the deepening rift between his rivals and attempted to exploit it. One of Xerxes' vassals, who is a Macedonian king, is sent to the Athenians and to the Spartans with an offer that they should um, come quietly and Xerxes will treat them decently. The Athenians, hoping to force the Spartans to fully mobilize their military machine, considered the deal. The Athenians allow a threat to be uh, quietly conveyed to the Spartans, that if the Spartans do not come to the defense of Attica, do not move into Boeotia, uh, the Athenians might withdraw. Or worse, the Athenians hinted at the unthinkable, an alliance with Persia. At that point, Sparta's blandly elusive ambassadors decided the political chess game must end. The Greeks would unite for one final confrontation with the Persians, near the town of Plataea. They've all got to uh, march to the same drummer. And here really is where Spartan leadership comes to the fore. The Spartans are now under the command of not a king, uh, but a regent, uh, Pausanias. By the summer of 479 BC, the Persian forces had swelled to more than 50,000. To the south, Sparta mobilized 5,000 of its finest warriors, while Athens contributed an additional 8,000 troops. Then the Spartans armed 35,000 Messenian helots, offering them freedom in exchange for bravery on the battlefield. Pausanias seems to have a lot of really raw organizational capacity. Um, he's got a lot of military sense. Uh, he's got, perhaps though more important than that, a sense of how diplomatically to keep together this large, diverse, internally conflicted uh, Greek force. It's not clear uh, that anybody other than a Spartan could have pulled that off at this point. For 11 days, the rival commanders held fast to their respective positions on the plain of Plataea. Mardonius and the Persian cavalry to the north, Posenius and the Greek infantry to the south. Finally, at the crack of dawn the next morning, the Persians broke the deadlock with a thundering assault. The Persian cavalry is able to inflict really severe initial damage on the Greek forces. The Greeks were forced to redeploy their troops. Although the 5,000 Spartan hoplites comprised only 10% of the Allied force, their discipline, heavy body armor, and thrusting spears made them an overpowering presence. I think once the Persians decide to fight an infantry battle on the plain of Plataea, there's not much that Mardonius or the Persian high command can do because ultimately it's going to be a question of men with wicker and linen trying to charge ranks of serried spears. And there's no army in the world that can do that other than the Spartan army. As the ferocious battle intensified, the heavily armed Spartans turned the battlefield into a river of blood. The Persians were butchered like cattle. The Spartans uh, were the, the heart of the Greek uh, success at the Battle of uh, Plataea. This was a hoplite battle and the Spartans had the strongest Greek hoplite army. They were playing to their strengths. So if Salamis is the signature victory of the Athenians, the victory at sea, Plataea is the signature uh, victory uh, of the Spartans, this, uh, the victory on land. The end finally came when Persian general Mardonius was killed. His guardsmen fled for their lives, while the few Persian soldiers still standing scattered to the four winds. Greek losses were minimal, around 1,000. However, the Persian troops, once 50,000 strong, were decisively defeated. As a fighting force, they were no longer a threat, ending forever King Xerxes' dream of conquering the West.